Welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming and joining in um, my discussion uh, around about my um, uh, activities out in Malawi uh, and hopefully future proposals as well. So as Peter said, I'm Donna Todd, I'm Senior Lecturer for Women, Children and Young People here in the School of Nursing at RGU. Um, my background is Children and Young People's Nursing uh, by profession. Um, so what I'd like to do is just start with maybe giving you some background about Malawi, where Malawi is, the, a little bit of the context of Malawi, and then go on to a little bit about my history in terms of my work in Malawi and finish off with the, the most recent project that I did that we're hopefully going to go on and develop uh, with future projects. So where is Malawi? Um, there we are, it's sub-Saharan Africa. Um, completely landlocked, between, uh, sitting in between Mozambique, uh, Zamb um, Tanzania and Z Z um, Zambia. Um, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, um, getting better, but still quite low down in, 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 the, in the charts, if you like. A um, little bit of facts about uh, Malawi. Um, the majority of its income comes from some agriculture, particularly tobacco. Um, tobacco industry has gone in there and, and taken over some farmland and promised to buy tobacco leaves at a particular price. Um, however, um, climatic change over recent years has meant that um, they're not getting the price for their tobacco. It's not as good um, for sale. Um, similarly, in the past, one of the staple diets for Malawians has been um, millet seed, um, but a, few, a good few years ago they changed to rice, they found that their conditions were good for growing rice. However, again with the climatic change, that didn't last very long, where they were getting some source from selling their rice uh, to, to their neighbouring countries. Um, the, 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 late, the later um, wet season and the, the, the huge flooding that ta takes place during that time um, has altered that for them. One of the other biggest sources of income is Lake Malawi there, um, which takes up most of the eastern border um, of Malawi. <clears throat> Big source of food for them, uh, lots of fish in there, and uh, chambu, one of the uh, delicacies across there, a very nice fish to eat. Um, but there's some talk about have they got oil under there and looking for oil. Giving some problems uh, for the locals thinking, um, well, what's the pollution going to do to our um, fishing industry? But equally, um, what's Tanzania and Mozambique going to say? Because part of Lake Malawi belongs to, a very small part belongs to Mozambique. But again, where's that oil going underground and which country does it belong to? So it could be some turmoil in there. Um, as I said, the clim climatic change is causing some problems for Malawi. The, the rainy season is getting a little bit later. And when it does come, it's a deluge and quite a lot of flooding takes place round about January, February time. So a little bit about statistics and given that we're in Scotland um, and there's some strong links between Scotland and Malawi, I thought I would compare Malawi with Scotland. Um, as you can see, population, um, the, the area is only about 15,000 square miles uh, longer than Scotland itself, only a third bigger, but their population is three times as much and the population density is three times as much as well. Um, the other thing that I've put up there in terms of the, the project that I recently did is the Malawi has round about a million orphans um, and there's about 10,000 children and young people living on the street, the majority of those being in the long way and Blantyre, um, Blantyre having the biggest um, population of street children. That's just a little bit about Malawi and how, it's, how it's, the infrastructure goes and how um, uh, it's, it's governed uh, throughout the country. Split into three regions, northern region, central region and the southern region. With each of those we've got them into southeast, southwest zones, central east and central west zones and the northern zone. Northern zone being the, most, the least populated and the most remote in terms of access to services. As I said, um, Scotland, Malawi have, um, tripping on the wires, um, 
Scotland and Malawi have a, a close, close connection from the days of David Livingston. We have the Scotland Malawi partnership, which is based here in, in Edinburgh, um, in our Scot in, um, uh, presided over by the Scottish government. But we also have the Malawi Scotland partnership um, based in Malawi. And our, my most recent colleague that I worked with, Dr. Anne Poya, recently became chair of the Malawi Scotland partnership towards the end of last year. Um, As I said, links go back as far as David Livingston, um, and indeed their old capital, Blantyre, was named after David Livingston's birthplace. Um, just last May, President Matarika was across in the Scottish Government and uh, signed new uh, agreement with the Scottish Government and Nicola Sturgeon in our connections and the work that we'll do together as two countries. And just prior to that, um, the Scottish Government had supported £150,000 worth of funding for training of doctors in Malawi. So, lots of um, connections, and it's through those, uh, the Scottish Gar Government, the, the Scottish Malawi Partnership and DFID, that I originally uh, started working on, with colleagues on some projects in Malawi. So just a little bit about my background in, in terms of what I've, what I've been involved in in Malawi. It started round about 2012 um, uh, through one of my colleagues, Professor Tracy Humphreys, who was the professor of midwifery here in uh, RGU. Um, we got some funding to train some community midwife assistants uh, in Malawi. Malawi had um, and still has quite a low um, maternal infant mortality morbidity, um, improved since, since, the, some, some, since some of these projects started. Um, so uh, the idea was we would do an 18 month, develop an 18 month programme to train some girls from the local villages in the remote and rural areas who would then be able to support the midwives with routine um, maternal health care and infant health care. Um, I didn't get involved from the midwifery side because I'm not a midwife, but um, we also wanted to look at developing mentorship for these community midwife assistants. Um, so that, there was, that was my role. I went out and we did some train the trainer in terms of mentorship through the, uni through the colleges and through some of the staff within the health service. And the top picture is the, the, uh, just a, a, a picture of the work that we were doing at the time. Following that project and, and through the evaluation of the project, we were hearing from uh, some of the women uh, that had attended um, some of the health services for, for maternal care that um, their human rights, their, their women's rights were not necessarily being respected and they were quite often subject to verbal uh, physical abuse. Um, and that was another element that was putting off women from going and using um, the, the health services which was part of um, the low mortality, morbidity rates at, at the time. So along with uh, Professor Rebecca Wallace, who has uh, a background in international law and human rights, we developed a respectful maternal care uh, project, um, human rights based approach, um, and went out to, to work with the colleges in developing uh, this into the education of students, but also uh, CPD, continuous professional development for um, staff that were already uh, working out in the field. Um, we also, part of that project was also about working with the, the Malawian Nursing Midwifery Council in developing their regulation of midwifery uh, and maternal health, and also going out to the communities to sensitise communities in hu uh, human rights, women's rights, and what should be expected in terms of maternal care. And again, the second picture down shows uh, some of the, the work that we were doing at that time. Obviously, as I've said, my um, background is not matern uh, it was not midwifery. I'm a children's nurse. So while I was out there, I was quite keen to find um, potential projects working with children and young people and to develop those. And um, during my variety of visits between 2012 and 2017, um, I got introduced to a, a good number of people in Malawi. And at one point, um, 
I had a bundle of children's clothes from infant age through to teenage age that had been donated across here in this country um, and wasn't sure what to do with them. So on one of my trips, I thought I'll take them out to Malawi and um, that might be another way of connecting into um, finding out if there was anything we could do with children and young people. As a result of that, the bottom picture here, the first bundle of clothes that I took across, this was um, a visit to an orphanage set up by my colleague, Dr. Ann Poyer. Um, uh, and the, the chap that I'm meeting there is James Mahoney, who, is, who works with Sweet Aroma, a, a non-charitable organization um, that works with children in the street. Um, and beside, beside us is um, uh, the housekeeper for, for the orphanage. This was a local government orphanage. And at the time, there were around about 40 children living there. Um, age ranged from about six years old, the youngest were about six, uh, up to um, mid to late teens. So from that meet, I spoke to James and said, there must be something we could do to develop a project, something we could do. Um, let's have a think about this. Um, but some of the work that James was doing, as I said, Sweet Aroma is the charity, the NGO that he works with, was uh, in this bottom picture here. These are some of the street children that he was working with at the time on the Methuzu project, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and that was using uh, uh, art therapy, particularly music, dance, um, to help support the children in understanding who they were, where they were coming from, what was happening to them, and also a little bit about um, sensitizing communities, because this was a concert that was held, um, and uh, they were out in the communities t singing about their, their plight, if you like. So, not long after that, came back to Scotland, and there was a call put out through RGU from the Scottish Funding Council with some money to develop a proposal to do some work in the likes of sub-Saharan countries um, in developing um, and help, uh, uh, a variety of initiatives. And uh, Professor Rebecca Wallace and I got together and had a chat. Um, Rebecca was thinking there was maybe something we could do and what could that be? So I had a chat with um, James as well. And we came up with the idea of going out to do a scoping exercise. One of the things that was being muted at the time was the, yes, there was a child protection policy. It was produced by UNICEF, but it wasn't widely adhered to, wasn't widely used throughout the, the country. It wasn't widely known about. Um, so we, um, we thought we could go out, do a scoping exercise, find out what the needs of the children in Malawi were, and from that, perhaps help develop a strategy, a policy for child health, child protection that could be initiated in this local government orphanage and then hopefully following evaluation and success be rolled out across the country uh, as something that all organisations could um, um, use. However, that was in the September and we went out in November, well, that was around about November, we were successful with our application. We go, went back out in April and to find that, yes, we'd set all the, our project up. We were going to work in this orphanage, but when we got there, there were no longer any children in the orphanage. Um, in the time that I'd been there, um, one of the walls and the boundaries of the orphanage had fallen down, so all the children ran away. <laughs> um, the other element to it was the, uh, the manager at the time that had been there previously was very uh, proactive and worked alongside Sweet Aroma and was, saw the importance of psychosocial support. But they'd been replaced by a new manager who was a bit more authoritarian and said, well, the children have run away, that's their chance, they're not getting back in. And it's only when new, ones were, uh, new children were identified that they were um, slowly coming back in. The picture I've got on this slide is the original um, a uh, picture I took when I visited the orphanage the first time with the first set of clothes and that was the two youngest children that were there who were very happy to play uh, with the balloons that we took along at the time. So we, got to, we had the project designed, we had it all set up but we actually couldn't work with the orphanage. So we kind of had to backtrack a little bit and think about well um, what can we do and we decided that in actual fact we would um, look at perhaps developing um, 
policy or um, <clears throat> uh, uh, legislation for Sweet Aroma themselves as an organisation that they could perhaps work with, develop and go out and connect with all the organisations that they connect with and perhaps it could be we could get some kind of rollout from there. And also the scoping exercise itself would give us some idea for the development of any future work that um, we might want to, to, to continue with. So what did we do? Um, we, we got approval, we went and spoke to two different kind of groups of people. We went and spoke to the professionals. We had a stakeholder day um, with them, uh, which involved some introductions, a little bit about myself, a little bit about RGU and why we were doing the project. And I also gave them a little bit of, um, I, I, I guess, some information about adverse childhood events to link that with street children. Um, obviously, adverse childhood events is something that's quite um, current and topical here in Scotland at the moment, and I felt that perhaps it could transfer and, and does transfer across to Malawi. Um, and the gasps from the audience uh, were, were very audible when they were thinking, we didn't know anything of that. We need some training, basically, is what they were saying. Um, so within the, the, the professional stakeholder day, we had some group work um, and we, we basically had a, a six questions that we asked the groups. Five of the groups were professionals from um, uh, various ministry departments, the Ministry of Gender, Ministry um, for Social, Social Services, Ministry of Health. But we also had representatives from the police, from churches, from other NGOs that were working with street children. And uh, James, um, unknown to me, had also arranged media coverage and we had the day publicised on the news and in the papers uh, at the time. The other element to the research, um, I wanted to go and find out what the actual villagers were saying about street children. So James uh, identified two areas, uh, two districts within the Longway area um, uh, to, to go, that had a, a particular problem with um, street children and had arranged for around about 10 villagers from each of those areas to come and talk to us. So we had two separate days and two separate villages. Um, obviously, when it came to doing the, 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 the work, when it came to the professionals, English is the first language in Malawi, um, um, uh, officially. So with the professionals, uh, everything was done in English. Um, but the, the villagers, um, not quite so. When you're out into some of the district areas um, and some of the remote and rural areas, um, it's mainly Chichewa um, that the people speak their, their, their own language. Uh, and of course, when it came to the, the stakeholder day, one of the groups were, was made up of village leaders um, and they um, conducted their group in Chichewa as well. So we had some, uh, we had to translate the questions into Chichewa. Um, James and his colleagues held the, the four focus groups and we recorded them and then within that week they had also translated them back into English for me. So everything was done within a week, it was fantastic. Um, the, the, the pictures at the side here show the, the stakeholder, the top two show the stakeholder day. In the middle is James Mahoney uh, from Sweet Aroma um, and then down below is some of the group work that was taking place with some of the professionals. The very bottom picture is uh, where we held one of the, the, the village forums. Um, we were in um, Area 36 for one of the uh, forums and uh, Chisomo for the other one. This is a school in Chisomo and the lady that's sitting there works with Sweet Aroma. 21-year-old, um, fascinating to talk to. She had been a street child herself from the age of nine. Uh, Sweet Aroma had got in and worked with her and she'd been part of the Mithuzu project uh, when it came to the, the choir and singing and so on. And she still remains quite active with Sweet Aroma. But listening to her stories as well, very openly, very unemotionally talking about how she was subject to rape and, and a variety of abuses. Um, kind of shocking the fact that it was just matter of fact from herself. Um, but I guess... Um, that, that it's, uh, as you'll find out from some of the results, that some of the challenges that these street children experience and become a bit matter of fact with them. So, we wanted to find out what, why did children go out onto the street? What were the challenges that they experienced on the street? Um, 
What kind of things would help the situation? Did, were, they, were people aware of if anything was available at the moment to help? Have a, have a think about what, what did the children actually need themselves? Um, we also asked the village, the people from the village, I was going to call them the village people there, but that might be, that might be wrong. But um, the people from the village, um, what they felt they needed, but also equally asked the professionals what they felt was required as well. Um, picture there is um, from the centre of Lilongwe and an area where um, you can see kind of in the background a bit of a slum there, um, uh, which was market area um, and where you could quite often find or would likely to be find, find some children that were on the street. So I'll just take you through some of the, the, the results are not kind of finalised at the moment. I've kind of briefly um, divided them up into kind of themes under each of the, uh, under each of the um, questions and divided it between professionals and um, villagers just to see if there was any difference um, or similarities even in terms of what they were saying. Um, one of the key things that I've picked up is actually the, the professionals was, was much more of a professional talk, the villagers it was much more, um, I, I don't know, a, a humane aspect to things um, in terms of what they were thinking. But the villagers themselves thinking about why uh, our street child, uh, children take to the street, a number of things, they're the things you would possibly um, uh, expect, broken families, abuse, and etc., etc. Professionals coming up with very similar ideas to that as well. Um, interestingly, the villagers here said actually being a real orphan, because that's one of the things about street children is they're not all necessarily orphans. They're more likely to be abandoned rather than orphaned. Um, the other, the other element that the professionals picked up on is it could be that um, children were actually born on the street to people that were already of the street um, in, that, in that sense. Um, this also kind of matches the literature. Street children or, or children of the street is not unique to Malawi. Um, and it matches kind of similar research papers that are written about other countries within Africa, countries in Asia and countries in, in South America. Um, so the reasons why children end up on the street are very, very similar worldwide. Um, one of the things we might want to do in terms of looking at things for the future is thinking about the definition of street children because there can be two different aspects. There are children of the street and children on the street. One of the, defini the definitions of, of the street is the children are truly 24-7 on the street, um, living rough with no... Um, permanent place to go or no secure place to go at night with any guardians whereas children on the street might be children that go out during the day skip school um, do some of the begging and go home to parents or guardians um, at night <clears throat> and some of that is some of the reason why um, children end up on the streets so you can see there under the professionals they said that they were sent by parents to beg um, just to clarify one of the things at the bottom of the villagers, distance and location, that was another kind of, um, not surprise, but something I hadn't thought of. But children in the very remote and rural areas uh, in some of the air, um, parts of Lilongwe or even across Malawi would walk into the main towns and do their begging. But it was such a long distance, they ended up just staying there and wouldn't go back home. And that's how they become the street children. Um, challenges for living on the street, again, probably no surprises and probably uh, nothing unique to Malawi there. The abuse that they might be exposed to with physical, sexual, uh, gender-based violence and so on. Interestingly, the professionals said death is also one of the challenges which wasn't picked up by the villagers. Um, however, you'll see later on the villagers do say the impact on the village when a child dies is quite significant when one of their children dies. Um, but there's some of these things, it's not just those physical things, there's lack of identity, um, uh, belonging, um, but equally you could probably turn that around and say perhaps they're getting the wrong identity by identifying themselves as street children. Um, they're learning the bad behaviour. Um, other, other elements um, from the villagers' point of view, children on the street tend to be accused of anything that goes wrong. 
muggings or theft. If that's happened in your area, it has to have been a street child. Uh, it comes with the stigma um, in there. And for that reason, some of the uh, professional agencies will target street children for that, whether it was them or not. But equally, being on the street um, kind of um, uh, suggests that children will become involved in criminal activities, whether coerced or forced or just by the natural course of things in order to be able to actually just stay alive. I've broken this bit down because we did ask the professionals what they felt were, were some of the challenges for themselves. Um, this picture down here is the group the, on the day that we had the, the professional stakeholder day. Um, but again, probably not surprises there, inadequate resources, lack of trained personnel. Sounds like very similar things that we say about our organisations here. But in comparison as to the, the scale of, of this, that we pale into insignificance really compared to their um, uh, lack of resources, etc. Um, so some of the things that they picked up on here, which mirrored what we'd already thought about in terms of developing legislation, was this poor coordination between agencies. There's lots of agencies out there doing things, but nobody's doing a standard thing, nobody's talking to each other. Um, people tend to be doing things in silo. And I think that that's even more um, emphasized by the fact that there's so many um, countries going in to support Malawi. So you've got American, Norway, British, um, other European countries going in and possibly doing very similar things, but from their perspectives, from their home country and their, their understanding and not necessarily joining up. And equally, agencies within Scotland all going in and doing similar things without speaking to each other, um, which is one of the things the Scottish Government um, and DFID were, were hoping to, uh, are hoping to address in, in any future funding of projects that we should talk with other organisations within Scotland to, before going out and doing something, either how we complement or how we supplement what, what we're all doing. Um, one of the things, another thing that the, the, the Organ um, professional said was attacks on staff. So um, if a child's constantly being persecuted by members of, of professional agency, they do tend to lash out. And perhaps f uh, given their background, the reasons why they're on the street and also what they're subjected to on the street, it's actually possibly only natural that they might retaliate when somebody tries to enforce things. Um, and one of the other key things that they brought up was documentation. Um, and it's certainly something we found out when we were doing the maternity Maternal health care, um, paper documentation is, does exist, um, but not necessarily organised. Quite often, partograms were found for lots of different women in a drawer in a desk, rather than in patient notes. Um, an IT structure for um, record keeping is, is n not so easy either, um, uh, because the... the um, there can be problems with connectivity and electricity supply. So that kind of makes it difficult to, to keep ourselves, or, or for Malawians to keep themselves connected in a big way. In terms of the villagers, what, what, what was the challenges for them for having street children and, and children from their villages on the street? They were saying things like, it's a shame. We're shamed by this, we feel bad. Um, we're given a bad name because our children are on the street shock when they find out it is one of their children that's on the street. Um, and as, as I already mentioned, this is where the, the villagers mentioned dying and said if, a, if one of their children that's on the street does die, it has a big impact on the village in terms of how they feel about um, uh, how that's happened. One of the other things and some of the stories that were being told, um, if a child, um, and I, I was told a story of a child who had um, been coerced by an adult to go to a particular wood to collect wood and it was okay to chop down trees. Um, he did question it, he was only eight at the time or so, um, did question it and um, because it is illegal you can only use wood that's fallen rather than chop trees down. They're trying to reforest many parts of Malawi. Um, but he was caught doing this by the, the other village that um, this forest uh, um, belonged to. Um, they chased him, caught him, 
um, but before they could do anything, he'd managed to get away and run away. But what they did then was go to the parents and made the parents pay for whatever. That child then said, I can't go home, one, because of the shame of what I've done, and two, until I've made the money to pay back my parents because they can't afford these fines, um, I can't really show face again. But I really want to go back to my family. So the stories like that were coming out. Anecdotal stories from uh, my colleagues in, in um, uh, um, Sweden, Roma. Obviously things like parenting skills um, and so on. Alcohol as well and drugs because even within the, the small townships, the villages, um, there was always quite often a bar or two or a nightclub and children maybe getting into their teenage years become attracted to that area and then they get coerced in and then they get the addiction to the alcohol and it becomes quite freely given to them. Um, so asked next question, what would help the situation? Um, again, quite a lot of similarities here, nothing we, we, we wouldn't expect. Um, providing shelter, giving the children a single place that they can go and stay that's safe. Um, there was some stories um, that children would quite often um, sleep overnight in bus shelters or bus stations, um, which quite often had guards. And if you had a good guard, they'd allow you to sleep and they'd maybe give you a bit of food. But equally, they might ab um, abuse you in the sense that, actually, I'll sleep and you go and do my job around the perimeter. <laughs> um, but you'll be safe here. Um, give it, getting some capital. It wasn't all about the responsibility of organisations or the government to support the children and the families and the communities. Um, there was some there, so giving capital and there was certainly things about giving cash to the poorer uh, families and, and in terms of being able to support their children through school because it, um, you do have to pay um, elements of schooling. Um, and if you can't pay that, the school then suspend the child and then the child just goes into a vicious cycle of not going to school and being on the streets. Um, and it's quite easy and quite nice to take the alms and the givings of other people. Um, and it's an easy life from that perspective. Um, they talked about rehab for kids. One of the things that they, that they did mention was the importance of things like recreation um, and perhaps having funded games for example, football, and that's the picture I've got up here, actually. This, well, the, the, the last visit I did, um, my nephews had had, um, uh, had collected football t-shirts over the years and decided they didn't want them anymore, so I took them out to Malawi. Um, and there's a bunch, we met up with a bunch, James is in the picture there, took me to meet a bunch of the guys. Some of them are wearing their tops. The, mo the more famous the top, the more they were likely to recognise it. And they do recognise a lot of the British teams, particularly the English teams, but also some of Europe. But when it came to, my family from Fife, when it came to the East Fife top, it was left on the table and said, where's that? Um, but they did eventually take it because it was a football top nonetheless. But football, thinking about funded games, football, getting the children involved, the street kids involved and doing something and, uh, um, and, and off the streets a little bit. Um, a bit there about encouraging the Bible, that came mainly from the villagers, um, but some of the NGOs were churches. Religion is a big thing across in Malawi and is quite a big structure for um, how, how uh, Malawians live their lives. So th th that quite often came up with some of these as well. Um, when, ask, when asking the, the villagers and the um, professionals, what do children need? Um, they were coming up, they came up with basic things such as f clothing, food, um, water, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs definitely in there. But it wasn't just those physical things. I, I was impressed, I, I, it, well it touched me, love and protection, peace, good life. There was the humanity aspect to things and even the, um, uh, the professionals came in with that as well, the care and the love and sense of belonging. Earlier on they talked about um, not knowing who they were, this, um, and that's why the, the challenges of being on the street and why they were on the street. So this sense of belonging was important. Um, again, I've split this one up into two because this was asking the villagers, what do you think as, village, as a village, as people within the village, as families, you would need in, in terms of... Um, 
uh, to help you with the kids. And it was kind of mirroring what they said were the needs. We want clothes, we want school. Sometimes there wasn't a school that was close enough or um, equipped enough to keep the children, um, and especially if there was no school fees. They wanted satisfaction um, uh, out of all of this. Place for children, counselling, all, all the, the usual things. Um, and one of the things there as well, trainers with empathy, not just people to come in and help them with their counselling. They wanted real empathy and they also wanted a love for all stages of the childhood and of the rehabilitation process. Um, that was quite important. Pictures there, just a, a matter of interest. This was a community sensitisation event that we did in relation to the maternal health. And these dancers that are there, I don't know if you can see them uh, very well, um, are the, oh, let me get the pronunciation of this right. Let's go. The Guliwamkulu, which um, traditionally were um, tribesmen and they dressed up in all these clothes and masks and you wouldn't know who they were, but they were quite high, um, important people within the village. And they did have a sinister element to them traditionally. Um, these days they tend to be used at gathering communities together to come for a, a community event, uh, a talk or whatever. So they're quite often put on as a show. Again, they still have this secrecy about who they actually are. Um, we're asking them about how, they, um, how, how things are actually done at the moment. Are, is there anything in place at the moment that can protect uh, street children? Um, villagers came up with the child is supposed to be registered. So that is something that could keep them safe. But um, it's about the registration of the birth, basically. It, should happen, it is a legal requirement, but it doesn't always happen for everybody. And if that hasn't happened, then um, how can you have any documentation about the child, um, as we were talking about? They say that people do find children and they do give them counselling, that does happen now and again. Um, they also mentioned that you know who the orphans are, so you go and report them to the authorities and tell them, so that can happen. They said that we do love the children um, and Treat them equally. Well, they want to be treated equally. They want to treat them equally, but we know with the, um, uh, and they know as well with the accusations of witchcraft and then the criminality that they do get tainted with um, the, these ide uh, ideas, even though it might not be true. Um, the, the professionals came up with more of the, the things about the laws that are there, childcare policies, they exist. Um, the police brought up they have a victim support unit. I did ask them, is it actually used? Do people come forward? If you're telling me they're scared of authority figures, do people actually come forward from the street to tell you they've been abused? Um, he was quite adamant they did, um, and it was well used, but it, it didn't kind of marry up with what they were saying about people being scared to come in and use services. Um, there are some financial incentives, social transfer, cash transfers and bursaries for the poorer uh, villagers and families um, to give them money to, for the child to go to school. Um, but people don't necessarily always know about it or even apply for it. So that's kind of some of the themes that came out in terms of what we're finding. You can see there was some similarities between um, the professionals and the villagers in terms of why the children were on the street, the challenges, and what would be good f to help um, improve the situation. Um, what would have been really, really good is if we'd been able to go and speak with the children themselves um, to find out what their take was about why they were on the street. I'm, I'm pretty certain, based on the anecdotal stories that have been told, um, we, they would come up with similar um, um, uh, points as the, as the villagers themselves had. What was interesting from, from some of the children when I was donating the, the um, uh, clothes, um, they all want, or they all appear and say, they want to get back into education, they want to get back to their communities, they want to get back to their families. Um, so there seems to be a desire for that to happen. Um, and certainly a, a life on the street must be quite daunting for, for children and young people. So think about the future. I've already had some talks with um, AMREF uh, and a variety of other people um, thinking about developing a peripatetic healthcare system um, perhaps something around about um, a nurse going around the areas, doing some triaging for the children in terms of 
injuries. Um, one of the things that was brought up uh, in terms of the challenges was that children um, will get physically injured on the street and then won't necessarily um, go to the healthcare services because they don't know how to or they're too scared to. And they're then looked after by similar young people, which isn't always the best and doesn't necessarily lead to a good outcome. Um, so perhaps doing some triage in terms of um, trauma, triage in terms of just normal everyday childhood illnesses, um, but also doing some child development. How are, the, how are these children growing and developing? And lastly, um, the big three kind of um, diseases that are out there, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and um, TB is on the rise there. Malaria, quite a big one. Um, and when I put this proposal through Sweet Aroma, James at Sweet Aroma, through AMREF, um, Dr. Poya, um, that um, James came back very, very quickly and said, that would be absolutely fantastic because a week after I had been there the last time doing this project, he'd gone back and some of the boys that were in the picture, there was two boys that he'd found in the street that were in a malaria crisis, didn't realize that's what it was, didn't access services. And through his agency, they went and took them to the hospital to get treatment. But the anecdotal stories again from James, the children not understanding their malaria, their crises, or oh, what, what do you do? Oh, we took some paracetamol and that was us, we're better. And better not just isn't better now, but let's be cured. And that's not the case, necessarily the case. So something around about that in terms of a peripatetic kind of health service, of course, all of these things, you'd want them all at one time because everything feeds into each other. But when it comes to looking for funding, when it comes to doing a manageable project, we're probably gonna have to break it down a little bit. One of the other things that put there was the development of IT structure and had discussions with a colleague, uh, Alan White, um, with regards to what could perhaps be done there in terms of using in, uh, IT, both in education, training, and in um, uh, keeping data. Um, so that could be something, but perhaps that could start off initially just as, as the health part. Um, development of professional learning training as well, that, that came out from the, stakehold, uh, the stakeholder day with the professionals, especially after they'd seen my presentation on adverse childhood events, so realising I didn't know that, I didn't know how severe that was and I didn't know that would have a lifelong impact. We need training, is basically what they said. And again, we could perhaps use IT for some of that in terms of uh, continuous professional development. Psychosocial support obviously required both for what they've experienced on the street, what they've experienced prior to getting on the street, and then thinking about that in terms of um, rehabilitation back to communities and back to families. But that's another big project there. And when I was speaking with AMREF and put a proposal, um, um, AMREF have people working in Malawi and I've spoken with them, but they have people working in Kenya and it's the Kenyan people I was speaking to and they were quite keen to do a twin city um, comparison with the top, first topic um, between Nairobi and Lilongwe. Could be a possibility, um, but um, they wanted to also add in the psychosocial support at that point and thinking oh, that might be too big a project to do all in one go. Um, and then the actual education for professionals, um, not just the training and the learning on the job kind of thing, but actual education for professionals, um, perhaps going into the colleges a little bit like we did with um, community midwife assistance and the respectful maternal care, working alongside our colleagues there to develop uh, education. But also one of the big things is the children want to go back to school themselves. The longer they've been out, the more they've missed. Um, some of the things they were talking about in terms of getting back into school might not be about going back and doing all the topics, but going in and doing some vocational skills. So something there about developing something for the education and rehabilitation into education for the street child. And lastly, community sensitisation. Breaking the myths about street children. How can the community support the street children? And there is a big... Um, drive in Malawi to be community empowered and responsible as well. They do see that they're not just saying you've got to provide this, they're saying well we need help to be able to do this uh, and take this forward. And perhaps some of that can be incorporated at different levels um, with any of those projects. 
those are just my ideas. And James and I sat in Malawi one and we drew out a whole area in Malawi that we could have shelter, we could have a house, uh, education, we could have the health centre, we could that these children, and it was all going to become um, uh, a Garden of Eden, if you like, for, for street children, and we'd get them back to their homes eventually. But uh, you can't do all of that in one go. Um, I mentioned some of the partners, definitely keeping in touch and working with Sweet Aroma um, uh, as our, our contact NGO. Um, AMREF, I've mentioned, very keen to work with us. Um, the Scottish Malawi Partnership and the Malawi Scotland Partnership. Now we know the uh, chair of the Malawi Scotland Partnership, a very key figure for us, very high up, and has also had government jobs in various ministries. So perhaps there's things there we can work with um, uh, and perhaps find funding as well. The government ministries, as I said at the stakeholder event, we had a variety of people from some of the ministries there and um, the social services as well, and obviously health services. However, nothing's easy. All these things are big. This is some pictures from Malawi um, and just thinking about the infrastructure itself and getting around and about. These are the streets, typical streets between villages. It can take half a day to walk 30 kilometers from your village to the nearest school, um, uh, health service, whatever. Um, so the infrastructure is not great. And this is in the dry season, you can see Quite dry, compact, easy to go. There's a chap on his bike, but down below, if you're driving along in a four by four, um, you get all the dust coming up and you can't see where you're going at all. And then you think of the wet season, those uh, gouges where the tires are become deep and entrenched. It's named by a four by four. It's, it's difficult to get through. And then they spend a lot of the dry season patching them up again. Um, so very little tarmac areas, bikes and foot being the predominant um, mode of transport and certainly when we've been go when we've going out there over the last few years and doing some training some of the people attending our training sessions have been up since about three four in the morning and walked a good few hours and still been late for our eight o'clock start nine o'clock start so um difficulties with that the middle picture there is one of the health centers in one of the villages um quite often no electricity no running water and the water comes from the water pump across on the far, my right there. Um, and that's my colleague Jane having a go at trying to pump it, not very easy. And I think this, this if I remember correctly, this, this health centre here had a, a pump, a water pump that was like a bike. So not only were you drawing up water, but you were generating electricity at the same time. Hopefully the two never met. <laughs> um, and down in the bottom right hand corner, an ambulance quite often the only ambulance for a number of villages um, that has to drive the, in, in, in the conditions. You can see that's a tarmac road, but it's all dusty. Um, but the other problem with that is quite often kept near a health centre with no money to fuel it. So nowhere to get anywhere or someone siphoned it <laughs> uh, for other reasons. Um, so, and, and that's the one and only railway line that goes from the north to the south of Malawi, single track. Um, and I think I've only heard a train running on it once uh, in, in all the time I was there. Probably bad luck and timing and so on, uh, being able to do that. But the other challenges uh, along with that is poverty. We were hearing from our colleagues in the health service, I haven't been paid for three months because the government doesn't have the money to pay me. But they've been paying the teachers. And then three months later, they'll stop paying the teachers and they'll pay the health staff. So. It swings and round about all, all, all around. Um, I've mentioned the electricity um, and connectivity. And a lot of Malawi relies on hydropower and it's drying up. The river that produces that is drying up. So that's affecting their electricity. And uh, the last time I was there, depending which area of La uh, Longa you were in, you could have your electricity shut off for a good 16 hours per day or a good two weeks out of a month they would just rotate it around so it could be shared out. So some real challenges, some of it coming from the poverty, some of it climatic change, um, that won't make any of that any easier to do. And that's a huge project on its own, um, helping rehabilitate street children. The key thing though of any future project, and the Malawi government is uh, absolutely certain on this, it shouldn't be about the uh, uh, authorities looking after the children, it should be about rehabilitation back to 
families or at least their communities. So any project that's designed needs to be rehabilitation back and back into education as well. Can't go to Malawi without catching some of the nice sights and sounds of Malawi and um, uh, experiencing what Malawi has to offer. So um, here's the, the monkeys up in um, Zomba and the hippos down at the Shiri River. Thank you very much.